Hey, Amy. Yeah, Juan. Give me that beat. It's Baseball Shangri-La with Amy Cuevas and Juan Ramirez. What's up, party people? She is Amy Cuevas. I am Juan Ramirez. You are listening or watching Baseball Shangri-La. If you are listening to us on the audio portion of the podcast, please make sure you're subscribed to the podcast. Rate us, write us a review, help spread the word. If you're watching us on YouTube, make sure you're subscribed to our YouTube channel. Hit that notification button. Give us a thumbs up. Leave us comments. We love engaging with you. And most importantly, make sure you're following us on social media on X at BB Shangri-La on Instagram, YouTube, and Twitch at Baseball Shangri-La. Amy, ¿cómo estás? Hi, are you overheating on your side? Because I am right now over here. I, I'm not overheating. I'm just dealing with the fact, for those of you watching on YouTube, I am aware that I look like the picture of Marty McFly's family in Back to the Future. I don't know how to fix this. There's some backlighting issue that I have in my studio. And my apologies to you. I just can't. The, the you're, sun is you're half You're half hologram. It's fine. Hey, the, is the Tupac few... over there? Can, can no, you see him? I, have you ever seen Tupac and me in the same room? That's all <gasps> I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. I'll leave you with that. <laughs> uh, Amy, how was your weekend? Uh, it was good. We have We have a lot of baseball to talk about. And we're in the midst of baseball because there was baseball happening Monday night for some people on this show. Right. And we so we didn't record last night on Monday. We didn't drop a show on Monday because I was at the Doyer game. So we're going to talk about that experience in our next episode. So for today, we're going to look back at the week that was and in particular, some interesting storylines that I think are developing for the Dodgers. So the first thing I want to start with, Amy, is Clayton Kershaw is pitching tonight. Oh, oh, wow. It's a play that happened. What two weeks ago? I, uh, yeah, but I'm foreshadowing what's going to come up later in this episode. We we may or may not be talking about Kike Hernandez, so you know, I brought his bobblehead of, just in case. Yeah, for those of you listening to the podcast, uh, uh, Amy is holding up her Kike Hernandez bobblehead, and so I'm sure she's going to try to find a way to you know work that in every episode from this point on until the end of the season. No promises, um, but maybe. So at the time we are recording this, it is right before game two of the Doyers and the Phillies of Philadelphia series. Uh, Clayton Kershaw is pitching tonight. Uh, now, Clayton came off of his second start last week against the show pots. So in order for us to talk about his start up coming up with the Phillies, let's go back in time, shall we, to last week when he was facing the show pods and and it wasn't pretty. It wasn't pretty. Uh, it wasn't pretty. So last night on the way home, I was listening to Dave essay on, on Dodger talk. And I think Dave, Dave was hearing, he was acknowledging that uh, people were just not very positive about Clayton Kershaw, especially after that start in, in San Diego against the show pods. And Dave essay was telling everybody, he repeated this many, many times to say, Give the guy a chance. Give the guy a chance. Now, Dave S.A. had said that you have to give Clayton Kershaw at least five starts. So let's start there, Amy. What did you see in the start in, in San Diego? Because my friend Joe Houses, the famous Joe Houses, who I, I happened to go to the game with on Monday, Joe Houses was in San Diego, and he got to see Kershaw and the show pods up front and he was texting me like what is happening what is happening uh what did you see with Clayton Kershaw in that start in San Diego um so it for a moment there it was a little reminiscent of of game one in the NLDS um just because there was it started out okay that first inning was good um and then the second inning he got an out right away but then it was a single a walk a single fielder's choice so I mean between all of that, they scored four runs in the in the second inning right away. Um, he ended up only going 3.2 innings, uh, so three and two-thirds. And one of the stats that came out of it, this was his 423rd regular season start, and he had a streak going where he had at least one strikeout in every game. And that 
ended with this this previous game against the Padres because he got no strikeouts. Um, and he's had the longest streak since 1893. So I feel bad for him. And I, I agree with Dave Vasse because the what I was thinking when, when he got pulled was like, people are going to potentially turn on him. This is only his second start. Like he... he he's going to need some time before they can, they can gauge whether he's able to go down the long haul. You know, before we go on to that, can we just acknowledge how uh, the numbers that you just threw out, how ridiculous that really is. 423 games. Not only that, but it's since the 1800s. So Mm -hmm. like two centuries. (laughs) Now I'm curious in the 1800s, did someone have a streak longer than him? I think that's when they started um, measuring it. And I think um, there was another pitcher. And then I think it was Nolan Ryan was the stat as far as like who had the, the longest. I'd, I'd have to look up. I'm so do it. we know if Kershaw had the longest or is he, he didn't know he did. He had so the longest. Kershaw, that, that is ridiculous. And I mean, that is just another thing that you can just add to his, his resume. But mm-hmm. in terms of performance, I'm going to be honest with you, Amy, what we saw against the show pods is what I expected his first time out. But I think it's the difference between the Gigantes and the show pods. The show pods are ranked at one of the top teams. They're either second. Last time I checked this, it was the Royals of Kansas City that were the top team that had the least amount of strikeouts. That means those teams, they're contact. They make contact. They make contact. So what concerns me, the show pods were two at that point. I don't know what they are now is what is Kershaw going to be like against teams that make contact? Uh, You know, he got a lot of swing in the miss against the Gigantes. He had six strikeouts, which really surprised me. I wasn't expecting that. So when I saw that, I was very encouraged. But then when he went against the show pods and he didn't strike anyone out and they and they were making contact on him, that was one of those things that for me, Amy, I, like I had no problem with seeing him pitch in the regular season, but I said this at the beginning of the season. If Kershaw pitches in the postseason, I I'm very concerned about the Dodgers rotation just because everything that you just said, he is still coming he's coming off of injury. I don't know if he's 100% healthy. He came back ahead of schedule. Everybody Mm -hmm. expected him not to come back until like the middle of August or in August. And he was already back in the middle of July. So, you know, all major leaguers say it takes time to get acclimated. So who knows how long it's going to take. Here is my thing. And this is what I'm looking forward to, to tonight when he pitches against the Phillies of Philadelphia. If he gets, if it's another outing like it is against the show pods, look, what are you going to do? I mean, those are two playoff teams right now. He's got to find his his footing, though. I agree. Once the postseason gets here, those are going to be closer games, and you can't be giving up runs like that when typically in a playoff game, it's not going to be a blowout. It's going to be decided between one or two runs. So that will need to be cleaned up. I agree with you 100% on that but it's only his second start. So c- carry on, carry on. <laughs> no, I, 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 and I think they, uh, what Dave SA says in terms of five starts, I, I wouldn't even put a number on it. I would just let him pitch until the regular, until the end of the season. In my mind, he, I don't think he should be in the playoff roster. I, at this point, I, I, and this is what I'm concerned about. Let's say he pitches great against the Phillies tonight. And he looks good. And then he looks good again in the next year, in the, his next start. And let's say he, you know, he looks competitive. He's competitive in all his starts between now and towards the end of the season. Is that going to convince the Dodgers that they should include him in the playoff roster? And that, for me, that's right- going to depend on how many pitchers we even have at that point that are still healthy. And I'm sure they're factoring in how many innings he's going because he only went four I think the last time and he went three and two thirds this time so if we're not getting length out of him if we're going to use him in the postseason they're going to have to piggyback him because we can't we're still continuing we're going to get to this with the bullpen but we're continuing to have I'll I'll pause and I'll put a pin in that go ahead (laughs) 
Um, I, I mean, it's just one of those things where you, we have to keep an eye on it in terms of how he looks. Yeah. Now, this may be if he gets rocked by the Phillies tonight and then he still doesn't look good. I think the answer it, it's it's there. And I don't even think he himself, knowing how hard he is on himself, that even he would sit there and try to convince every the Dodgers to be like, I, I should be pitching in the playoffs. You know, I think it. I, I believe he is honest enough with himself that I don't think he would try to fool himself. If you see all the post-game interviews, I feel like he is. He'll be honest and say, hey, I sucked. I, I yeah, sucked tonight. But in the, in the book that he, that he wrote with, um, I think it was Andy McCullough, there were times where he knew, not he knew he shouldn't have pitched, but they called on him and he won't say no because he wants to be there for his team. So if pitching a god forbid i hope it doesn't happen gets decimated and they call on him he will say yes no matter where he's at so like so that's you're, that's you're, a concern too so what you're worried about is not necessarily you don't trust kershaw you don't trust the dodgers you think just, maybe they might put him in that position again no i'm just saying there's a lot that's going to happen between now and october there's a lot that i'm sure they're looking for and there are so many factors. It's not just, is he good or isn't he good? Like, they're not looking at that. I, as you know, I know that's not what you're saying. But, I mean, he's got to go deeper into games. He can't be giving up seven runs, you know, while he's out there. I think, like, I, there's – it's only a second start, I guess, is is kind of where I come back to when no, I'm looking it, at all of this. And and I think you're right with, with Dave Vasse saying that. He's really good about kind of balancing some of those critiques against the team because much like how I kind of look at it, it's like, okay, there you can shoulda, woulda, coulda all you want. You can care about this team all you want. But at the end of the day, this is your team. Do you love it or do you just want to complain about it? Because if that's the case, then then what are we we we're talking about two different things. Um, I did find the stat though. And it said, so it was 423 regular season starts with at least one strikeout. Um, and that was the longest since the mound was moved to its current distance in 1893. So it was wow. because the mound was moved. Um, and Kershaw led that list with 423. Tom Seaver had 411 and Nolan Ryan had 382 games um, before they didn't have a strike. I mean, there's two months left in the season. For me, it's there's, there's just a lot of question marks. And yes, I agree that two starts is not enough. And like I said, I don't even know if five is, is an accurate number. My question marks are this, and that is he's older. He's coming off of an injury. I have questions about his stamina. You know, once he gets into the playoffs, the intensity is ratcheted up, you know, is will his body betray him again? And, you know, because the velocity is not there, but if there is anybody and he's shown it before that he can find ways to pitch, I, I just, I would myself would feel more confident. I know that those rookies, Robleski and Ryan are there, they're rookies, but the thing that they have, and it, and it balances out because obviously Kershaw has the experience. He's been there before, but the guys like Robleski and Ryan also have velocity on their side where it sometimes all it takes is here. Yeah, I'm just going to throw it as hard as I can and, and see if you can beat me, but you're right. There is still a lot of time left. I know there was an update on Yamamoto. Do you want to give the update on Yamamoto or do you not have it? Um, I don't have it in front of me. Go ahead. Okay. So he did throw, a bullpen session today. Now, I was on record as saying I don't think he was going to come back this year. But if he's throwing a bullpen, Amy, like how realistic do you think, like how much longer can the Dodgers wait where he can have enough time to get amped up and actually pitch and maybe be used in the postseason? I just, I mean, what are the options though? So they just, they try to ramp him up. He maybe isn't ready and then they don't use him. I, I mean, at this point you kind of have to try and see. Uh, and but see like in terms out. of in game action, does he have to pitch maybe at the beginning of September? Do you think by the middle of September, like how many starts would you be comfortable with 
him pitching in the regular season before the playoffs start, before you could say, you know what, we should put him on the playoff roster. <laughs> for, for I know this is going to sound whatever, but it, it's not up to me. <laughs> like if they decide to play him, then all right, cool. Then I'm going to, I'm going to back him as a pitcher, but I, it just, if they can ramp him up, they're going to be watching him more closely than anybody. Um, I was just talking to somebody this week and they were talking about like injuries and how people will say things like, well, we didn't know what it was or, you know, they changed it and they said this or that. And it's like, these people have the best doctors. They have the best trainers. They're going to be keeping an eye on him. If they, if they say we're going to bring him in the last two weeks of September, we're going to ramp him up and that's going to be good enough. Then all right, then here we go. Buckle up. So. Yeah, even I mean, two months seems like it's a long time, but I, I am concerned that time is running out for some of these guys who are injured and to get into playing shape because, you know, we're, we're talking about stamina, uh, you know. What I, would you rather have them do, though? Like, just like, what do you <laughs> I guess? What is your alternative? I know. I, I think they're in a tough spot and we're going to get into it into the in the next episode because there's going to be a numbers crunch. Because guys are starting to come back. And so with guys coming back, now you got to decide who are you going to send down? I mean, get, Kevin Biggio just got DFA'd. Mm -hmm. my, my concern is this. This team has not been healthy all year. You come back. You bring guys back from injury. What if they get hurt again and you've already released somebody? And, and now you're gotten to a point where it's so far late in the season I don't even know if they pick anybody up, if they'd be eligible to be on the playoff roster. So that's why I'm saying I think they're in a very tough situation where I think in their sight, whether it's a hard deadline or not, I think they have to understand, all right, if we're not seeing this amount of progress, then we have to go another route. Like, I feel like when they made those trades for all those infielders, I thought maybe they know, I don't know about Muncie coming back, right? And I get it. They have to prepare for that because if Muncie co doesn't come back, they got to have at least backup. So they have to prepare for that. So so that's why I think the Dodgers are in a tough situation. And so the fact that Yamamoto threw a bullpen, obviously we still need to see how he reacts from the bullpen session that he has. How soon will he have? I, I just, for me, like I said, it's two months away, but it does seem like time is is... is is really going through uh, is speeding up on everybody and they're going to run out of time. But you look at what happened in San Diego. Yeah. The Kershaw game was ugly. They had no chance in that they got motorboated, but that previous game, that first game in San Diego, they probably should have won that game. And, and you look at it there. They, if things go their way, they take two out of three in Houston, they split the series in San Diego, and then they take two out of three in Oakland. It's a completely different road trip. It's five and three. They have more of a padded, you know, lead in the division. Now the Serpientes and the show pods are five games back. So now it's not just a matter of winning the division. Now I think the Dodgers might be in a fight even for a wild card spot because in the national league, the wild card is, is crazy. I mean, we're not there yet. I think we don't, we don't need to full on panic yet. We're still four and a half games up. I mean, uh, you're five games above Arizona and San Diego. We we knew that this was a, a challenge, especially with all the injuries going into it. So the fact that we're still leading the, the National League West, I think is like they're doing the best that they can. I think for me, like when I'm looking at these, I'm, t I'm taking the positives from the game. Like Glasnow went seven innings. That's the first start with seven or more innings pitched since Stone did that that complete game, that nine innings in in May, at the end of May. That was 26 games ago. So um, I think it was Eric Steven who put up some stats as far as like breaking the season into thirds. So the first 54 games, um, they had 25 qualified starts. The second half out of the next 54 games, they had 13 qualified starts. So that is, it's trending the way we've already been seeing it. So these guys are not going deep into games. We need the bullpen to be able to get some rest and not have to be on every night. Some of these guys are pitching back-to-back -back days. Um, but we did get to see Kopech also um, in his first game. He debuted as a Dodger on on Wednesday in that game. He came in after Kershaw and um, did a pretty good job. He, he struck out the side. Like, great job, guy. <laughs> he was, And he was throwing, I think they recorded, it was 
99.7, 99.2, and 100.6 miles per hour in each of those. So, he, I mean, he came in and, and he did his job, which, you know, coming from the White Sox, I heard some some reports on social media, like, he would go out and do his best in those games, but it's hard when your team isn't winning. And, and we have fans on this side that are like, oh, my God, are we going to make it to October? And, oh, we're only five games up. And, like, this guy just came from a team. He just got a gain of 40 games. So, like, I think it's perspective. It's, you know, if we get in on a wild card, it's not, you know, obviously that's not the way we want to go. But we've done it, you know, at least one time in the last 11 years. It's it's making it there. It's the it doesn't matter if I get straight A's in high school and somebody kind of skates by on C's. We're both going to get into college at some point or we're both going to go to community college. Nobody checks your grades like it's you know, if you win a series, you lose a series. It's not great. It's not a good feeling. But at the end of the day, they're they're trying to win the season to make it to the to the end. So I think it's just uh, perspective. Kopech has looked good uh, since the Dodgers acquired him, and he does throw hard. I got asked a lot of questions in that game that he pitched in San Diego as to why didn't they use him to close out the game, the first game in San Diego, the one where Blake Trident gave up two brutal home runs, and then the show pods came back to, to, to win that game. Uh, to me, my answer to that is Kopech had just joined the team I hear this many times. Managers look for soft landings whenever they acquire a new player to get them acclimated. I think that's the reason why Kopech was not used in that game on Tuesday. Um, I, I also think, look, right now the Dodgers don't have a closer, so they're, they're playing matchups. I thought for sure maybe they would use Kopech to close some games in Oakland, and they ended up using Anthony Banda. So... Mm -hmm. The Dodgers have their own ideas of what they're doing with the bullpen. You mean uh, because it's their team? Yes, it's it's their team. It's not the fans. So they're going to be making the decisions. Um, Blake Trinan, as a result, got put on uh, the injured list when they activated Bruzdar Gatterall. So I am curious if that is a real hip issue uh, that, that Blake Trinan has or if it's also just the fact that uh, the stamina thing where they want to give him some rest and they can't afford to give him some rest because of the guys that are coming back in the bullpen, because it's a numbers game. And like I said, we're going to get into it in the next episode. They can't have all of them up. So guys who maybe are showing signs like are those home runs that Trinan gave up in San Diego? Are those because he's tired because he started off the season? Great. He was almost unhittable. He had a zero ERA. And, he had, like, and, and they put him on with left hip discomfort. So, I mean, it, it could just be wear and tear. These guys, like, what was it? I think it was Tuesday's game. There was a stat out that the bullpen had a six, um, six and three quarters ERA. Like, so over the last 13 games, like, they're they're gassed. And they're still gassed. Out of the, the five games we just played, not, I'm not counting in Philly because I don't have the stats for that, only two games, Flaherty and Glasnow, Flaherty went six innings. Glasnow went seven. Kershaw's three and two thirds. Stone went four innings. River Ryan went four and two thirds. They're not going deep. These guys are getting taxed. We're using anywhere at this point from three to five a night. I think the only exception was Flaherty's game where they two, he only had two others come in. He had Kopech and Trinan. Like it's it, some and and I did do some homework. I was poking around during different games. A majority of the teams, they're anywhere from four. Most of them are four to five. Some of them have six. I think I saw a random seven here and there. So it's not just a Dodgers issue. This isn't a cross baseball issue. So it's something that hopefully they'll be looking at in the offseason because if starters cannot go deep, something has to change because it's not fair to your relievers to put this much wear and tear on them. It's just it's not okay. It, it is fascinating to me that they are very concerned with the starters arms, but they don't seem to show that same concern with the bullpen arms. Uh, and I get it. They're, they're relief pitchers and they're on a different pay scale than starters. Uh, yeah, but you but can still only have so many on your team. So if I only have X amount of relievers and I've gassed them all, you either need to give each team a bigger allotment of people to carry on their roster, or you've got to change something. Because it's not healthy for the starters or the relievers at this point. Well, the bullpen looked much better in Oakland. 
uh, than it did in, in San Diego. And I know we got to see the debut of Jack Flaherty, and I think it's exactly what the doctor ordered. He went six innings, shut out ball. He worked out of a bases loaded jam. Look, if this is the Jack Flaherty that the Dodgers are going to get these next two months and then going into the playoffs. I think that is a very, very, I know we didn't get a chance to talk about the acquisition because it happened after we recorded last week's show. I was very surprised to see what the Dodgers gave up to get Jack Flaherty compared to what other teams gave up. Like the Astros gave up a lot to get Kikuchi out of the Blue Jays. Now, and just for anybody who is is not versed in, in who we gave up, we gave up um, minor league AAA player um, shortstop Trey Sweeney, who we'd gotten from the Yankees earlier in the year. And then we had a class A catcher, um, Tyrone Liranzo. So both of those went over to Detroit. Who was in the top 15. He's a top 15 prospect in the Dodgers system. Now, one of those things is he's blocked. You got Will Smith. And then, yeah, I think Dalton rushing is ahead of him. So if you're a catcher in the Dodger system right now, I think it's going to be hard for you to, to make the major leagues. So the fact that the Dodgers gave him up, I know the Yankees were in on Flaherty. Ken Rosenthal afterwards came out. They said something about Flaherty's back. Flaherty had actually taken an epidural shot earlier in the season. It doesn't seem like he's showing any effects of it. But they I also, think all... they backpedaled after that, too. So we yeah, don't and know I'm if curious... that was substantiated because, again, like we wear media hats. We also wear fan hats. And, you know. But that was coming from Ken Rosenthal. So I wonder if the reason why he backpedaled is because of you said this many times in terms of HIPAA. Maybe Kevin Rosenthal, Ken Rosenthal shouldn't have put that out there about his back. Like it may have happened. He may have had an epidural. But hey, we don't want that out there. But it also may have been that well, it was the, the it was the Yankees that I saw that backpedaled. So if if Rosenthal did, I honestly I didn't. I didn't yeah, follow. but for me, somebody in the Yankees organization leaked that to Rosenthal because when that trade came out, everybody said the Tigers got fleeced. Like, how is it that the Dodgers were able to get him for this amount? Why didn't the Yankees pull through with it? So. I, you know, I can't say this for a fact, but it just so happens after all that, then Rosenthal leaks that story and then the Yankees come back and backpedal. Well, and at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if we got him. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so Flaherty did go and went ahead and he, he looked good. Uh, I get it that it's the Oakland A's, but the Oakland A's were playing well in the second half of the season. They beat uh, us Friday. So, like, <laughs> Yeah, they, they did beat us, and poor Gavin Stone, just uh, that, that's another guy that I'm a little concerned about that, you know, he's a rookie. He's never pitched this much before in Major League Baseball. I don't. Did you see the post-game interview with, uh, with Gavin? I did, but there's been a lot since then. Is there something that stuck out to you? Uh, yeah, poor Gavin just looked like he was so pissed. He, he just looked, I, like, and, and he's a quiet guy. And it just felt, and I get it, he's probably so frustrated the way he's pitched. In his last few starts, he's got an ERA over seven. He's given up a lot of home runs. At the beginning of the season, he was able to to keep the ball in the park. And now, in, in, in I believe his last seven starts, he's averaging a little more than two home runs a game that he's giving up. And, of course, the question being asked of him, are you tired? Are you tired? And nobody's he going to admit you know he's, that he's he tired. He still has a 3.63 ERA though. Like it's guys are going to have bad days. So, I mean, I get it. You don't want to just throw a, a game and you know, it's not the best He He even said before he came out, he's like, I knew I wasn't on, like it didn't feel right, but they still have to go out there and throw. So like he did the best with what he had that day. And you know, they're going to have good days. They're going to have bad days. He's still got a 3.63 ERA. So he does, um, but like I, I, we're got to see. He, how and he, he may be tired. He, like, like you said, this is his first full season. We we used him on and off last year, but we didn't use him like we're using him this year. He's been the one consistent piece, especially now that that Paxton's gone. And that's why, for me, there's still a lot of question marks on this team going into the end of the season. Like, how will Gavin Stone finish the season? 
right now. He is trending. There are signs, you know, and like I said, there's nothing wrong with being tired. You know, he is, this is his first time he's pitching. I mean, guy, I mean, a guy who has more cred, an all-star Tyler glass now has never pitched this amount of innings, you know, and they gave him a break. And Gavin Stone, for the most part, has been carrying this staff the majority of the season, giving them the innings that they needed, saving them in situations. And I know people are going to point out ever since he had the complete game in Chicago is when he's been showing signs of just not being the same pitcher. And I don't know if nine innings against the Chicago White Sox is what was the tipping point for him. It also, like I said, has just been this is a career high for him in innings. He's never pitched this much. It it could be all of that. But it's like we were talking about um, on last week, at least last week's episode. And it got brought up again on on something else that I was listening to recently that they're not stretching out high school players, college players, minor leaguers until they get to the big leagues. So when you are a rookie basically carrying this team, there is going to be wear and tear. It doesn't matter if they've slowly stretched them out to this point. It's still a lot. So there, there's going to be wear on that. Um, there are some high points, I think, of this, too. We had in that in that 10-0 shutout on Saturday, we got to see the Dodgers playing small ball. Like, we saw each of them move each other down the line in the top of that ninth inning. Like, it was beautiful. And in that Shohei stole, you know, three bases in that game. And he's officially hit the the 30 for 30 club. He's one of the people who's, I think the stat was, he's the third f- fastest player to hit that. Um, and he's, I think actually right as of right now, as of last night's game, he's sitting at 34 and I think 33, I'd have to double check, but yeah, he's on pace to do 40-40, which is a very elite club in, in major league baseball. I believe there maybe is it five that there's Conseco bonds um alex rodriguez alfonso soriano uh and uh osuna uh, so yeah there, there's five members of the 4040 club so he can go ahead he has an opportunity to join that club at the end i kept hearing 50 50 and i'm just like Wow, you guys are getting really, really aggressive with that. I mean, if he goes 50-50, that means he just went on a, a, a complete tear, you know, the, the last two let's just play months. it out one game at a time and see how it goes. Like, take our gifts where we can get them. Um, my favorite thing of, of this was getting to see Kike pitch. So he ended up closing out that game because it, it was a blowout. It was 10-0. to 0. Um, He came in at... He it just four, four, faced four batters. His ERA is still zero. So he just – another stat came up um, as far as he's the only player in the modern era to have three-plus hits, plus pitch relief in a game, and have a shutout victory. Um, and Jeff Hamilton in 1989 pitched and had the three-plus hits, but I guess didn't have the victory. So – he, it seems like, you know, there's always a stat in baseball. It's one of the things I love about it, but to have some of these where like he just kind of owns them for right now is, is pretty cool. And we have, we have three um, Dodgers pitchers, position players to finish games with the win. And that was uh, Hans Alberto uh, eight games in 2022, Russell Martin, three games in 2019. And now we have Kike with one game in 2024. So great job. Kike. Yeah. Yeah, this is where I turn the show over to you so you can just continue to celebrate Geeky because he, he had himself a weekend in Oakland, not only with his pitching performance, he got two outs on two pitches. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, but Him and Lux are doing great. Uh, offensively, Geeky was actually showing, you know, signs of life in, in mm-hmm. Oakland. Uh, he did have that interview with Kirsten Watson afterwards, which was just, I don't know if you saw it. It was hilarious where, you know, he's coming in talking in the post game as, as a closer in the game. But when she asked him about being a two-way player, uh, he was just like, show, Hey, who, and then took off running. And it just very indicative of his character. Like, I love the levity that he brings to the team, but I, I think he's one of the underrated players. Like I love him. I think Rojas is one of those Will Smith, like. Some of these guys, like they have heart and they bring it to the field every day. Not that none of the Dodgers are doing that, but it just, I think it, it just adds to the team. But. So, I, I mean, 
they took two out of three in Oakland, and then they won the first se- game of the series against the Phillies of Philadelphia. And not only that, but they beat Aaron Nola, mm-hmm. one of the Phillies' top pitchers. Uh, now, I didn't realize to be- he's been in the game so long. They said something during the broadcast, and I'm like, wow, has he really been around that long? Yeah, and not only that, but it's like the Phillies are going through it right now. Uh, the Dodgers are technically a half game behind the Phillies for the top spot in the National League. As now, as one of our listeners, Philip Lopez, likes to hear, um, I think that would be baseball. <laughs> well, what they all go. go through it because they're none of them are going to be perfect all the way through. So yeah, so I I mean, uh, let's see how the Dodgers even things out in in the, in the rest of this series. Like if the Dodgers sweep here and the Phillies swept them in Philadelphia, and the Dodgers were probably in the same boat going into that series that the Phillies were going into this. I don't know if it's going to say much about both teams if they do end up meeting again in the playoffs where it's like, well, they both played each other when they weren't playing well. So who are the really, who are the real Phillies and who are the real Dodgers? Oh, but I, I, didn't, do think- I didn't realize you could schedule baseball like that. So. <laughs> <laughs> you absolutely can. You absolutely oh, can. Oh, my, so. my bad. Uh, did you see Lux has a 10-game hitting streak? Yeah, Gavin Lux has looked. And again, I, I I think maybe the Dodgers should consider hiring his uncle as a hitting coach <laughs> because whatever he taught Lux or whatever he did to adjust Lux over the All-Star break, I mean, Lux looks like a completely different player. And I know – People that watch him play every day are saying you just what you're seeing is confidence. I think he trusts his knee more. And that was him playing a full half of baseball on it. And it, it just it took him that long. I actually um Mike uh Petriello wrote an article for MLB.com about um smaller hit for contact guys who are have are noticeably swinging harder with the new approach over the last weeks. And so they were measuring what these guys did in the first half versus the second half. And they're saying that he shortened up his swing. So Anthony Volpe, Gavin Lux, Jeff McNeil, Victor uh, Robles. um, It just, it was a really interesting article to see that, you know, it's one of the newer stats they're starting to measure, but they could see that there was a marked improvement in what these guys are doing at the plate. And even from just a second half turnaround perspective, they were saying with Gavin Lux, he's hitting 400, He's got eight extra base hits. He's got 12 RBIs, six home runs. So he's hitting 241 um, after this was after Sunday's game. So I don't have the stat prior to, to Monday's game. And even for Kike, he's he's hitting 300, six extra base hits, eight RBIs, six home runs on the season as well. So like um, it, whatever these guys are doing, if their bats are waking up, I'm all for it. Did we did we light a candle? Did we did we smoke a cigar to Jobu? Like, what are we doing here? You know what? I, 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 like you said, it could be just baseball. It also could be they played the Oakland A's, that even though the Oakland A's have been playing better, they're still the Oakland A's. And, and I will say this I, I want to end the show this way. Uh, I don't know if you heard Steven Nelson on Sunday that in the broadcast. Did you, did you watch the broadcast? <laughs> I, I mix in radio with broadcast sometimes. It just depends. Uh, fill me in. He uh, he took the Oakland A's owner to task. Oh, yes, uh, I did. Sunday. Yes, I did hear he, that. Like, he did not hold back. Uh, he really laid in. And it is it is tragic. It is very sad because, you know, one of the one of the stories that he told during the broadcast was, you know, next year they're going to be playing in Sacramento. And you've been to that stadium mm-hmm. uh, where they're going to be playing. It's and small. so they. <laughs> they have to do a lot of retrofit to make it major league. You know, I don't know what the word is. It's not major league ready, but I guess to I think the it standards. Would, Butler even said like they didn't. I don't remember if it's not real turf, but like just the way that the yeah. turf is set up. I think it is not real turf. And he They're was putting, like, wait, he didn't realize and he didn't realize the weather there. And that the weather in the summer, it's like a hundred plus degrees. I mean, granted, it's dry heat, not the humidity that we have here or in Oakland, but to be playing in that weather on that field, he he didn't even realize the conditions. So he was a little like, "This this is what we're doing." Yeah. I, again, I, the, as much uh, the majority of the blame I think goes to John Fisher, the owner of the Oakland Athletics, but I I don't think Major League Baseball looks good in this at all. 
to allow this to happen, to have the players be playing in those kind of conditions. I'm very curious, not, not alone just what the A's are going to look like in terms of injuries next year, but what if visiting teams come in there and players get hurt because they're playing on a subpar field? There's going to be a lot of teams that aren't going to be happy about that. The, the capacity is 14,014 people. So 14014 fit in that, that park right now, Sutter Health Park in West Sacramento. Like 14,000 people. I mean, I guess that's kind of what you can expect for the A's right now with, with the way that they've treated their fan base. But with the way that the, the field conditions are, moving a team basically to a, a minor league I just, I don't, I don't understand much like there's a lot going on with the white Sox and the losses that they've suffered lately. And people are talking about that across social media. I don't understand with, with Oakland and with things like the white Sox, why are we continuing to spread out the luxury tax funds and have no repercussions? And you brought up the, the potential for having the TV rights shared in a pool. If you can get the bigger market teams to agree to it. And again, we can't even get this right. What are we doing? Uh, you, you know, it, it, it fascinates me, Amy, because to me, again, Rob Manfred works for the owners. This is a league that is run by the owners. Uh, there's a reason why the players union is the strongest union in this country. Uh, and they probably lost some of their power. But when you have, I mean, it fascinates me because this is all about capitalism, right? It's all about greed. It's all about making money. But at the same time, I don't hear, I know socialism is a bad word, but this is what, this is corporate welfare that these guys are operating. These owners by taking money from the Yankees, taking money from the Dodgers. And of course they're not, you can't let them police themselves because they're never going to call it out on themselves. So I, I, it, it is beyond frustrating to me. So that's why I don't have a problem when Gary Crochet says he wants to get paid and he wants his contract extended. I know he took some heat for making that comment, but I was like, I don't blame him for that. He's had to play in the White Sox organization who is not known that front office and Jerry Reinsdorf, the owner, they're not known for being good to their players. We, so, we've even heard the the mentality in the clubhouse is not great, even inter intermixing with the players themselves. Like I think Joe Kelly's even alluded to it that it's it's not stellar, and I just I don't I don't know how we fix that. I don't. There's there's so many things across baseball that I don't understand where we don't have consistency. Like even if we're gonna go, I think Kevin Kiermeyer was saying something about like he's not used to playing on like regular grass and how much better that would be for his body. Versus like we have stadiums all over and I understand each team gets to build their own, but like baseball is driven by stats. How do we have, you know, this field is better for home runs. This one's better for pitching. Like where's the consistency even in that? I, I don't understand where the people who are policing this sport, watching over some of this stuff, if wh why there's not more consistency, I, d I don't understand where the oversight is lacking. Yeah, uh, let's end on this note. I don't know. Did you see the picture uh, of poor Miguel Vargas in the dugout? I don't want to talk I, too much about that because I like that's it's messed up. Like it's so the, go, look, go ahead. My, I just I don't have much to add to it because I, I have friends who live on the south side of Chicago that have been lifelong White Sox fans. And they're just numb to this. They're they're absolutely numb to it because the White Sox have been bad for so long. You talk to any White Sox fan and they would have told you they wanted Jerry Reinsdorf to sell the team a long, long time ago. Um, but the same way that you had talked about how Michael Kopech gained 40 games and what it does to him, you have Miguel Vargas go in the opposite spectrum of this where he finally gets an opportunity to play. And now he's dropped in a situation that clearly is toxic, that is not a good environment. What is that going to do to him and his development as a player? So while I know people were playing that picture, sh sharing that picture for laughs, it is the reality of, you know, again, some players, look, you, you just landed. It's all about the situation that you're in. You know, you could have all the talent in the world, but if you're in a crappy situation, Mike Trout, 
Yeah, exactly. Mike Trout is a, and now, you know, we're pouring the number of injuries that this poor guy has had to deal with the last few years. Now you really have to wonder, look, this is what happened with Ken Griffey Jr. Ken Griffey Jr. started getting injured and it just completely altered his career. I know there's a lot of people who think if Ken Griffey Jr. would have stayed healthy, he would have been the one with all the records. Well, and I think for me, like the reason I don't want to talk too much about Vargas is he's obviously having a moment and the fact that it is being shared as kind of a joke online, I think is, it's just, it's insensitive. He's, he's the one who has to live it out and we know how toxic or we hear how toxic that whole situation is. Like, it's just, I, it's unfortunate because people are sharing it for a laugh and what are we doing to fix it? Like, I don't, don't, don't laugh at it. If you're not gonna, if there's not some way that we can bring light to it and then fix the imbalance across these teams, because to me, it's not funny that this is this young man's life. And I know people will say, and people have said it in the comments, ah, oh, he's just lucky to be in the show. Like, you know, I'd give my whatever just to be in it. And yeah, I'm sure he is very grateful. But like you said, if it is a toxic environment, what does that do to his psyche? What does that do to his development, his mental health? Not just because he, he lost 40 games, but because of where he ended up from the supportive place that he was at, it's, it's not that shouldn't be how we treat these people that trot out on the field every day to play this game for us. Look, I go back to what El Tio Albert Pujols said that when he went to the Dodgers after the Angels released him, that playing for the Dodgers reinvigorated his love for playing baseball. So I, I can see how going to a situation like the Las Medias Blancas, how that could turn you off and be like, do I even want to do this anymore? Like, well, and it's, and it's one screen grab that somebody picked to interpret their way to get clicks or whatever. And whether that's what the camera was showing, you don't know if he was just having a doubt. We don't even know. Maybe he's fine, but people have already brought their own narrative into it. And I just, this is some of the stuff about the sport that to me, it's, it's not funny. I, I don't like smack talking. It's not my thing. We've talked about that before. I don't like stuff like this because we should be celebrating these men who put their, their health and their, you know, yes, I get, I know they get to play this game, but they are, they are ruining their bodies to go out there. And like, to me, this isn't, it's not funny. It's not how we should treat them. Well, that's going to do it for this episode. This is going to drop right before the start of game two of the Doyers and the Phillies of Philadelphia. Let's see if the Dodgers can end up winning this series. I think it'd be great if they end up with a sweep and evening the season, this, the season series with the Phillies of Philadelphia, but we shall see how this turns out. Uh, Amy, any last words? Nope. I'm good. All right. It's, so all, it's all good. <laughs> it's all good in the hood. Uh, for those of you listening on the audio portion, please make sure you're subscribed to the podcast. Rate us, write us a review, help spread the word about the show. If you are watching us on YouTube, make sure you're subscribed to our YouTube channel. Hit that notification button. Give us a thumbs up. Leave us comments. We love engaging with you. And most importantly, make sure that you're following us on social media on X at BB Shangri LA, on Instagram, YouTube, and Twitch at Baseball Shangri LA. She is Amy Cuevas. I'm Juan Ramirez. Nos despedimos con un beso. Amy, say goodbye to the people. Goodbye, people.